Marketing Mojo Podcast. In today's episode, we're going to draw together themes from a couple of different series that we've been working on over the last few months. One of these was on the intersection of whiteness and parenting, and the other more recent one has been on the intersection of money and parenting. And one common theme across both of these topics is the idea of seeing someone who's different from you as somehow other than you. And so I'm deeply honored today to welcome Dr. John Powell, who is an internationally recognized expert in the areas of civil, civil rights and civil liberties. Dr. Powell is the director of the Othering and Belonging Institute at the University of California, Berkeley, which supports research to generate specific prescriptions for changes in policy and practice that address disparities related to race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, disability, and socioeconomics in California and nationwide. Dr. Powell is professor of law and also professor of African American studies and ethnic studies at UC Berkeley, and is the author of the book, Racing to Justice, Transforming Our Concepts of Self and Other to Build an Inclusive Society. Welcome, Dr. Powell. Nice to be here, Jan. And so I should also add that uh, we scheduled this interview way back in February because your calendar is absolutely bananas. Um, and we're just now talking here at the beginning of May. And so to put this in context, um, when, when we scheduled this in February, COVID-19 was something that was happening in China and really didn't seem to affect us very much or like it was going to affect us very much. And here in May, obviously, <laughs> we're in a very different situation. And so I think our conversation today is going to be even more powerful with this additional context of othering that we're seeing related to things like attacks on Asian Americans here in the US, as well as undercounting the number of Native Americans who have the virus, um, and how the whole world is basically shut down for an illness that's killed a small fraction of the number of people that die of real diseases and tuberculosis kill every year. Um, although obviously the people that those diseases typically kill is very different from the people who are seeing the highest numbers of COVID-19 cases. So I'm sure our discussion today is going to be against this backdrop. Um, and it, it, I think it makes it even more timely and uh, even more compelling to listen to. So. Um, so I wonder if we could maybe start with a definition, um, because othering is, I'm guessing, is a term that's not going to be so familiar to many of my listeners. So can you start by grounding us a little bit and, and telling us about what is othering, please? Sure. Uh, so there's, as you would expect, there are many different ways of thinking about othering and the flip side of belonging, which we'll get to, I guess, shortly. Mm -hmm, certainly um, will. <laughs> it comes from many different disciplines, some um, from healthcare, from sociology, from psychology, from philosophy, from feminist studies, um, from political science. Each one has a slightly different variation as to how they talk about it. But one way of thinking about it is just when you uh, do not accept someone else's full humanity and full equality. Uh, to use um, Judith Butler's concept is when people are not seen as grievable um, or when people don't count or in some way they're less than. So it could be, because there are different levels of othering. You can, uh, you can think of othering between a husband and wife, uh, but uh, you're not gonna have genocide in that context. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas when you have um, extreme othering of some groups, it also can bleed into gen genocide. Um, and this othering that's exploitive. Um, so Irish Young made the observation that to be superfluous, is worse than to be exploited because when you're superfluous you can be subject to genocide but when you're exploited mm -hmm. you're not likely to suffer genocide you're still mm -hmm. because you have um, a use to somebody that's right yeah. so there are different points of other but the, the, the sort of broad way of thinking about it is when someone is seen as uh, less than uh, fully equal uh, less than mutual um, and uh, and it can add to that like maybe a threat uh, in some sense, um, or indifferent. Um, so those are some some ways of thinking about it. Okay, and so I'm trying to think about this from a from a psychological perspective and. Um, thinking about, we, we, we've talked a long time ago now about how social groups form and, and a big part of it seems to be about creating this difference in your mind between what is me, what is myself, and, and to understand that you have to have something to compare it to, some kind of other. Um, how do you integrate that uh, psychological aspect into uh, the, the definitions of othering that you work with? Well, the psychological definitions tend to be individualistic. Uh, and uh, where some other definitions, certainly when I talk about Judith Butler or when I talk about sociology, uh, Steve Martin, uh, they're not psychological in that sense, in the sense that 
one of the, one of the preconditions to think about othering is um, when you think about group othering, there does seem to be a um, the mind is set to actually categorize and differentiate, which is, mm -hmm. and out of that comes the concept of in groups and out groups. Um, but uh, there's a lot of to suggest that there's no stability in in groups and out groups that people move in and out. Uh, and when we when we're talking about othering, uh, we're largely talking about it at a group level, not at an individual level. Uh, and there's no natural other. I mean, that's the mistake I think that a lot of the psychological literature suggests that you see someone that's different. And uh, as uh, the dean of Harvard Law School wrote a book called "What Difference Does a Difference Make?" So the psychological li literature seems to suggest that there's natural others, you know. And mm -hmm. we seem to think those natural others, the natural othering process, fall along certain well-traveled categories like race, mm -hmm. gender, uh, and that's clearly wrong. Uh, there's no natural other and there's no natural group. Um, and part of that comes from a misunderstanding of our uh, history. Uh, and so we think about, um, we organize in tribes. And so in tribes, we had intimate contact with uh, anywhere from 50 to 150 people. And that was it. And everyone else was an out group and potentially either a threat or indifferent. Um, but when we talk about whiteness, for example, we're not talking about 50 people. So that the, the two million years that we spent in tribes, uh, there was no concept of whiteness and people weren't organized around whiteness. They were organized around proximity. Mm -hmm. uh, and race as we know it um, is relatively new. Um, you know, few hundred years old um, and and then the capacity to actually define someone as a in-group is uh, a sociological process is not a in that it may build on a psychological tendency uh, but for example there are uh, over one billion christians they'll never see each other they have different languages they're different race but in some sense they think of themselves as a group mm -hmm. they identify as a group um, there's uh, 340 million Americans. Uh, and so why is that a group? That's, that has almost nothing to do in a deep sense with 50 people, right? It's a very mm -hmm. different process. And so, uh, so it's not that I see a person who is a different race than me and then I, a whole bunch of things happen. It's that I've actually been um, constituted in such a way, not on my own behalf, uh, not on my own efforts entirely. In fact, a lot of it is, it's pre-given. So for example, prejudice can only really exist when there's already a structure and a language and a grammar for prejudice that's not the individual. So there's a little tension between the way psychologists approach it and the way sociologists and others approach it. Yeah, for sure. And one thing I wanted to pick up in what you said was that the we, we sort of assume that these are essentialist categories, um, that, that I'm, I'm one thing or I'm another thing. And actually, we create these categories, right? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the immigration of Irish people who were not initially considered white in the US <laughs> when they first came over. Um, and so what, what are some of the other ways that you see this? You know, we think these are essentialist categories, but actually, they're they're not in any way essentialist right and, and sort of interesting question I, i've written a little bit about this so uh as you suggest essentialist sort of will, will locate something in the person it's just it's in your biology it's in your nature mm. can't change uh we have largely moved to an anti-essentialist posture uh in the sense that there are very few if any essential categories and even if they were essential the meaning is not essential uh, so when i was growing up this initially race was considered essential and you read stuff from the 1950s and 60s and race is talked about as being biological and essential <clears throat> excuse me and then some people would take that biological understanding of race and then attribute certain characteristics to it as that started to melt away or become contested people shifted and said okay race is not essential or biological it's sociological uh but gender aha now that is <laughs> And they're only, you know, you're man or woman, you know? Yeah. Uh, and people, some people early on said, well, that's not quite true. You can be more. And now, of course, people don't think of gender uh, or gender roles 
as essential as all at all. And, and there's no clear even biology associated with it. You have transgender. Um, and so again, in terms of the academy, uh, people question if there's anything that's essential. Now the mistake that people make with that is that they then assume because if we're not essential, and if we're if these categories are sociological and created, can we step outside of these categories and live in some way in which there are no categories? And that seems pretty wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and the categories don't have to be as rigid, and they can be multiple, and they can be fluid, and we can influence them. But the way the mind works and the way we work as people, we're always in relationship, and we need some categories. Uh, to actually negotiate the world. Uh, we simply take in too much information. So there's no, um, and another way of saying that is that all of our interactions are mediated. Uh, we have no direct um, interaction with the world or with each other or even with ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of an interesting person, my experience, and when they say that, they assume they're talking about some unmediated, unfiltered uh, phenomena. Uh, but most people who look at this carefully would say there's no such thing, that the very concept of perception is already um, structured, um, but it's not essential. So it's going to be restructured, and there are things we can do to shift it, um, but we can't simply step outside and have what people call the God's eye view and just see the world as mm. Yeah. And so when we start to think about uh, things that we could do that are different from uh, othering, one, one um, potential way we could think about it is, well, we could just, uh, I've seen it for, referred to as saming, you know, we, we could just say, well, we're going to treat everybody equally. Um, why, why is that a bad idea? Well, it's, it's, uh, it's first of all, it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> and in some ways, it's, uh, it's basically saying in order for me to treat you as a full human being, you have to become some version of me. Mm. Uh, and that's better than saying you're categorically different and I can never understand you and therefore I can do all these terrible things to you. It's like, so I have this, this thing, it's like, uh, be, because we are both the same and different, dialogue is necessary and possible. Uh, and what it means by that, if, if we were just the same, dialogue wouldn't be necessary. I don't need to talk to you if I'm the mm -hmm. same. I don't need to ask you how you feel. Um, you already know. <laughs> no, you know, it's like, what would I feel? Jen feels exactly as I would feel because she's an extension of me. Right. And the other is that because if we're totally different, the infinite other, uh, as Hegel talks about, then I couldn't understand. Uh, and so it's, it's, life is a little bit more messy. The other thing that's sort of interesting and I find very fascinating is that the process of, uh, so the process of saming in some ways an erasure. You know, it's like, um, and it's, it's actually kind of the liberal response to um, the categorical differences that we made in the past, like blacks or women, it's like, no, we're all the same. And that all the same, the person speaking generally is the dominant group. Uh, and so then in order to be a member of society, it means I have to adhere to whatever the dominant group considers to be the necessary thing. Uh, and so if you think about something like um, Bill Clinton's Don't Ask, Don't Tell, mm -hmm. right? Like you can join the military and kill people just like anybody else, uh, but we don't want to hear about your, you know, sexual exploits. But if I'm heterosexual, I'm a cis uh, heterosexual man, I can brag about my um, sexual exploits. So even in that formulation, you're saying one group can show up and, you know, be just be, be myself on the chest for how many sexual exploits I have. But if you're um, uh, homosexual, shh, don't, we don't want to talk yeah. about that. <laughs> different. And so the goal is not to be treated the same. In fact, the idea of equality from the Western concept comes from Aristotle. And Aristotle understood that there were two different forms of equality. One he calls arithmetic and one he calls geometric. Um, and um, arithmetic uh, um, is when we when people are situated the same. And he says basically to treat people who are situated the same um, is fair, or treat people who are situated the same differently is unfair. But when people are not situated the same, 
to treat them as if they were the same it doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. so we got half of Aristotle's uh, insights uh, and, uh, and not the other half. Mm. Yeah, and it, it seems as though uh, a, a lot of what you're speaking to is, is sort of getting at the idea of denying people agency. And, and I think I see that a fair bit in the parenting world. You know, I'm obviously white and a lot of people who are talking about parenting are <laughs> white. Um, and uh, schools, I think, are very much geared for the success of middle class white children. And, you know, in the parenting sphere, it's, it's really common to hear about uh, children needing protection and uh, often there are parents, specific groups of parents. They're usually, you know, black or brown, low socioeconomic status, uh, and these parents don't care about their children's education in some way. Um, and and in doing that, we're kind of removing, uh, we're constructing a narrative where we re really remove agency from these individuals, and we say, well, the school knows best, or the state knows best. And if only you parented like middle class white parents did, then your children would be so much better off and and so much better able to succeed in the world. Um, how, how do you relate what we've been talking uh, about? About so far to parenting and, and uh, the parenting world? Um, well, it's actually interesting on a number of levels. Uh, I mean, even the construction of the family, right, is a, it's a relatively new phenomenon. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, um, the idea of uh, the nuclear family yep. is now it's older, it's a few thousand years old, but it's not, you know, it's not a basic human trait. <laughs> right. In the way that we organize the family right and and just to to pause on that for a second i think it is assumed that the way that we when i say we you know <laughs> middle class white families organize the family around two parents a certain number of children probably living at some distance from grandparents that that is how families are right. um and and that that is what you're saying is that that is not the case at all right and, and in fact there's interesting uh um anthropological literature that suggests that anyway that we're doing it wrong but in, we're doing it in, the, in a way that we actually evolve we evolve not to have the nuclear family yeah. um, there's some ex, uh, some uh, examination of grandparents and all that um but you know again it's, it's, it's sociological we sort of have cultures we have expressions uh which is conflated with race but it's not the same as race um but even you know, it's sort of hard to get to a ground, and I know we're trying to do that, but if you think about, I mentioned Judith Butler, she wrote in Gender, uh, Gender Trouble. Um, um, she writes that the way we talk about agency is not only Western and white, it's also male. Uh, and so we again assert agency mainly in the context of a freestanding separate individual, that I can do what I want to do, or I have the capacity of will, uh, if you go back to psychology, which you mentioned earlier, uh, it's like it's a, it's a peeling an onion. So where does the will come from? What does, I mean, at a deeper level, where does the I come from? And so what uh, 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 Butler says is that there's agency, but it's not the same as conceived of in terms of uh, white dominant culture. That's a fiction. And, uh, and she says that the human being that's described um, in Western literature is actually a male. Um, and I would go further and say it's an aspiration, it's a distortion, because the agency that's actually reached for is to be freestanding. It's, for example, uh, in Western society, and this is particularly strong in the United States, uh, dependency is seen, seen, seen as a negative. And so part of agency is framed in terms of the opposite of dependency. And there are different kinds of dependencies or interdependencies, but uh, in part, because of the United States history with slavery, dependency has taken on a particularly negative connotation. So it's associated both with slavery uh, and with uh, femaleness. Uh, and so um, if you look at um, our reactions, for example, to the social safety net, we're always, even in this pandemic, it's like, well, we can't give people money because that will make them, it's a moral hazard. Mm -hmm. We can give corporations money because they don't suffer from that. Uh, or even we can give rich people money. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, poor people, you're going to make them dependent. So right. we can, in, in a way, we have this really distorted way of looking at people and the capacity of people. And that's not even just whiteness, right? That's the U.S expression of whiteness because mm -hmm. not nearly as strong in Europe or even to some even in Canada. Um, so I think agency has to be 
rethought and how do we actually have agency within relationships mm -hmm. and we have agency that never achieves uh, full autonomy yeah uh, never achieves sovereignty which is how we talk about agency yeah which is not as you said when we when we uh i say we the united states took land from native americans and it went to this, this issue went to the supreme court um in a, in a famous case and the Supreme Court justified the taking of the land because they weren't using it right and they were uh, in collective, they had a collective relationships rather than one person owning a piece of land. And then later they actually tried to correct this by giving Native Americans land, but they actually gave it to them as individuals instead of as a tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you think of agency within a tribe or agencies within a uh, interdependent set of networks or agency in relationship with the earth, um, it looks very different than agency that's standing apart from everything. Yeah, for sure. And, and of course, that's resulted in all kinds of problems with land getting divided into ever smaller pieces on a reservation, doesn't it? So, yeah. yeah. Children, right? It's like, you know, uh, uh, is it a problem that our children, especially today, are coming home, right? Or if they're, if they're mm -hmm. in, I mean, in, in many instances in the United States, we think of launching our children right. and then they're gone. It's like they're on their own, you know? Uh, and My that's, work is done. As <laughs> well as a parent, I've launched this job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's not the way uh, most of the societies, uh, and that's not historically what mm -hmm. happened. Yeah. Yeah. Children were never launched. And um, we're seeing a lot of um, psychological trauma associated with launching children. Uh, I teach at UC Berkeley, and they've studied as to why, for example, uh, students of color, but all students really actually have much more stress. Mm -hmm. um, and one reason that's one thing's associated with it is this extreme notion of individuality, uh, which means their, their ability to have resiliency, which is always a collective effort. Resiliency is not an individual effort. Mm -hmm. We're stressed out when we have trauma. One of the ways we deal with we turn to our community. Mm. If there's no community to turn to, right? Uh, what if that makes you weak? Uh, you know, if you're a guy, if you cry, it's like what if you be vulnerable? You know, um, so we have a lot of ideas that really don't uh, serve us well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just to backtrack slightly for uh, anyone who might have kind of missed the reference to uh, the sense of self and, and our ideas about the sense of self. <laughs> and so for some folks that might have gone over their heads, but I would just encourage you to listen back to our uh, interview with Dr. Chris Niebauer, um, who wrote the book, No Self, No Problem. Uh, that was actually <laughs> the last interview that I recorded and, and uh, very, very much, I think, feeds into the, this discussion of what you're saying about um, th this being a fictional idea that we have this, this sense of self. Um, so, um, kind of moving on a little bit, I, I feel like I'm, I'm skating on thin ice here because, uh, I, <laughs> I don't know exactly how to talk through this. So I'm, I'm going to look to your guidance on this. Um, and I, I'm looking to your book and, and you, st you cite statistics on poverty in your book. And I'm going to quote you, uh, you say that in 2009, 74% of blacks did not live in poverty and, and quote, there is an association of poverty and blackness that is reinforcing self-perpetuating and part of the racing process. process. And so I, I agree that the automatic association of black and poor is is not helpful to us um, but it's also a fact that 25% of blacks do live in poverty compared to fewer than 10% of whites and so one thing that I really appreciate about your work and your book is that you argue against this idea of closing the gap between blacks and whites as if whites uh, what whites have and are is some kind of gold standard and everybody else needs to um, as, uh, kind of achieve that standard and instead to have these conditions where nobody lives in poverty but the part i really struggle with is uh how we can do this without addressing the systems that have created a poverty level for blacks that is two and a half times what it is for whites because it seems to me that to do that we have to talk about how the systems we have now have created these two groups unequally so it's in my I'm trying to get out of this space in my mind where I feel like to examine othering it sort of feels like we have to define the other so how do I get out of that rhetorical catch-22 yeah no so it's actually a, a very nuanced uh, issue and and uh, um, and we don't have again sort of a grammar and vocabulary easily accessible to deal with it uh, so 
I've, I've written a short piece where I basically say uh, poverty, especially in the United States, is not primarily or simply the lack of stuff. And Emerito Sen, the Nobel economist from India, has written about this a lot. Uh, but it's a lack of belonging. Uh, mm. And if and when you think of not belonging, uh, which when we talked about if the, uh, the fix for othering is not saming, what is it? It's belonging. Um, uh, a lack of belonging or being other, uh, being seen less than human in some ways. Uh, Susan Fiss of Princeton has done some work around this and she has something called a stereotype content model. Uh, first of all, she shows that uh, being other happens at different levels. So not everyone's othered in the same way. Mm -hmm. So for example, and these are national samples, although she's done it in like 30 or 40 different countries. Um, women in the United States are othered in the sense that they're not seen as the same value as men, but they're, uh, but they're liked. Uh, mm -hmm. They're sometimes pitied. Uh, uh, and the same with old people. It's like, you know, my uncle so-and-so, you know, I like him. Uh, so her, her two axes is liking and competence. So you don't think women are as competent as men, but you at least like them, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas some group, which you think are not competent, and you don't like them. Mm. Uh, that's a deep kind of othering. And when you get deep into that group, there's a part of the brain that goes off when you see another human being. And nature just thought it would be kind of cool to recognize our same species. It doesn't mean you're gonna go have coffee with them or talk to them, uh, just sort of a recognition. When you deeply other someone, that part of the brain does not light up. Mm. Uh, and in fact, the part of the brain that does light up is the part of the brain associated with disgust. Um, so it's a little bit of a catch-22 of chicken and egg, but you can't develop effective social policies for people that you don't see as people. Mm -hmm. So it's not simply the lack of not having stuff. It's a, you could say, and I've argued this in some places, is that it's a lack of belonging and not having membership. Uh, and so that becomes the fight. And so, um, and, it's, and it's not a single thing, right? It's not just race, it's race and gender and class and sexual orientation and so all these things are actually in communication with each other and in our society we have this norm this is what a normal person looks like and it happens both at a conscious and unconscious level so i'm not i'm not, I'm not saying you don't address the condition but i'm saying the deep condition is the condition of not belonging and or only belonging provisionally. And back to our earlier conversation, it's the same kind of, it's a variation of saming. It's like, what do I need to be a healthy person? Mm -hmm. Oh, I need what white people have. Right? <laughs> it's like, well, wait a minute, white people don't look so healthy to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, but that's what you get, and that's all you get. Uh, plus, in a funny way, it not only deepens the othering of people of color or people who are not white, it actually also diminishes whites in some way, right? Because in, in, a, in a very subtle way, because um, if you see a white person suffering, can you have empathy, right? Uh, and my extreme example is think of uh, 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 Prince Harriet and Princess Meghan. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they literally want, you know, they literally are a princess and a prince. Mm -hmm. One's white and one's mixed and they're super rich, they're famous, they're royalty, they're young, they're beautiful. Do they suffer? Yes. Yeah. Can we take that into account? Now, not to center their suffering, not to center their, but to not ignore it either. Uh, and the other thing is sort of potentially dangerous about just sort of making it whites versus people of color, whites versus mm -hmm. everyone else. Um, is that it leaves out the elites. Uh, and if you think about the construction of whiteness, white, whiteness was the middle stratum. People of color was the bottom stratum. What was the top stratum? It was the elites. Mm. And the elites and, and early, on, early on did not consider themselves whites. The middle stratum had a role. The mm. role was to police and maintain the structure of racial dominance uh, for the elites mm -hmm. and to have allegiance to the elites, uh, but they were not the elites. And so oftentimes when we, if we frame things just in terms of whiteness versus, we forget the work that whiteness is doing as an ideology and how we, how we should apply it. Also, we confuse the ideology with the people. You know, so, you know, uh, 
you are phenotypically white, but are you are you um, performance constitutionally white? I don't know. I have to know more about you. <laughs> Race is socially constructed. Yeah. It can be constructed in such a way that people who are not phenotypically white are uh, whiteness and white in their performance, and people who are phenotypically white are not white in their performance. You talked about the Irish, yeah. uh, and um, so part of what it's saying is let's set a goal where everyone can achieve what we want people to achieve. When we do that, we do change conditions, but we're also not assuming the conditions we're aiming toward or aspiring to are conditions of whites. And part of what we're doing is changing the physical condition, but also changing uh, the conditions of belonging, the conditions of the, uh, the spiritual conditions, if you will, which we need to pay attention to. And the, the final thing I say on that for now is that in changing those conditions, it's not uh, paternalistic. It's not like I'm going to fix black people, or I'm going to fix gay people. It's everyone participates in creating, co-creating the thing that we belong to. So it's not already there. It might be saying, okay, you know, when Dr. King talked about being integrated into a burning house. Well, I might say, you know what? I'm gonna stay outside for a while until we get back to <laughs> I'm warm enough out here. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so it's a much more complicated process, but it's also uh, a much more engaging process. Mm -hmm. uh, it invites all of us in. And it also acknowledged that, uh, okay, so when you talk about children and families, you know, we don't want to uh, valorize or uh, romanticize Black families. You know, uh, we have pathology in Black families, but so do white families. So I don't want to necessarily trade my pathologies in for your pathologies. Mm. No mind better. So if we're going to try to be healthy, how do we actually have that conversation? How do we think about it? And how do we come together to sort of set aspirations for our collective uh, society? Yeah, I love that. And I think that, that that sort of gets to the next question that I had, which was, um, thinking about how other people raise their children, you know, this may be one of the first times when when parents in their role as parents uh, sort of come across this topic. And um, I think it's not totally uncommon to see some kinds of parents as lacking in some skills related to parenting. And, and we already talked about, you know, not caring about their children's education. And, and firstly, I mean, I think we ignore the tools that these parents do bring to their relationship with their children um, and that these are not valued in schools in the same way that uh, the tools and, and skills that other other kinds of parents do bring um, and secondly there are structural reasons that can prevent them from raising their children and participating in education in the same way that the middle-class white parents do which is assumed to be the right way um, and so I'm just wondering you know you you, you sort of posed a rhetorical question you know how can we um, uh, re reimagine what it means to be part of this society and this is a lot of the thinking that we're doing in on the podcast right now you're know, talking with people about how do we reimagine what education looks like and so um how can we how can what are some concrete things that we can do to reframe our ideas of what it means to be a good i mean i'm using air quotes so often in this. people are watching on youtube or seeing all my air quotes so people are listening on the podcast are missing out on them um, but what it means to be a good parent in a way that has space for these different approaches to raising children that the, the way we think about parenting right now just doesn't seem to have yeah no, i think those all of those are important questions um and of course the way you know the assumptions we have like uh you know, we raise our kids and very differently and when we're all farmers. I mean, at the beginning of the 19th century, something like 98% of the people uh, uh, close to that were farmers, right? So you're raising your kids for a certain world, mm -hmm. for a certain situation. That world now is less than 2% of the people in the United States are farmers. Uh, so we are urbanites and we assume, you know, um, again, I grew up in Detroit. Uh, the, the idea is you, hopefully, your kids were uh, could be gainfully employed, um, could stay out of trouble, and go to work in the factory. Mm -hmm. I was a, uh, when I uh, uh, went away to college, and I had I have one of the most loving families in the world. Um, the question was why? Why are you going to college? Um, you could stay here in the factory and get a job and make a good living and then 25, 30 years retire and be set for life, which is what most of my siblings and family members did. Uh, that's not true in Detroit anymore. Mm -hmm. You can't do that. 
so even uh, even the idea of education itself is being constantly be, uh, being reshaped. Um, you know, Dewey and Jefferson, who are oftentimes considered the early architects of education and educational thinking in the United States, they talked about education as one of its primary purpose was to help us become citizens. We're not naturally citizens. Um, we have to learn to take the perspective of others. That's what being a good citizen from Dewey's perspective meant. It meant the ability to actually, we would say empathize, but also perspective, take the perspective of others. Um, well, the very nation, notion of the way in which we do race in this country prevents that. Mm. So we're not interested in the perspective of black people. We're not interested in, I mean, it's a sort of a soft assimilation. We're trying to help black people become more like white people. Uh, and then there's also a fear. Um, and this is actually, I think, reflected in a lot of the Trump supporters, frankly, uh, but not just them. Uh, it's actually global. The world is changing very fast. And we don't know how to prepare our children for the right future because there are too many futures at stake or mm -hmm. maybe there is no future. Uh, and, and we also operate on the assumption of scarcity. You know, there's only so many people that can go to Berkeley and so many people, well, you know, sorry, but that's my kid, you know, so I have to push your kid off. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it's, it's complicated in multiple ways. There's a book called Other People's Children, right? It's like, how much am I willing to tax myself for other people's children? And what we see across the United States and seen for the last several decades is that as the school age population becomes more and more of kids of color and immigrant kids, uh, and the older people are still predominantly white and people with more financial resources, they are not inclined to tax themselves to pay for those kids. And that's what the book, Other People's Children. Um, uh, so I think we need a really sort of a whole new way of thinking about education and uh, educating. The other last thing I'll say on this is that we used to think of education as a public good. Now we think of it as a private good. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course it can be both or some of both, but if it's a private good, then it's mine and you know I can get it and whatever I get from going to college or whatever is mine and, uh, and I don't have to share it and and government is taxing me too much, as opposed to we're actually trying to create something together. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, I think the, the secret, of course, and uh, Alper talked about this in 1954, in the nature of prejudice, is contact. Uh, people need to have contact with each other. And people like Pettigrew and others have actually built on that Linda trope um, in terms of what is the nature of contact that creates a cohesive, uh, uh, interdependent and healthy society. Mm -hmm. There are certain conditions, you know, you have a shared goal, uh, you have uh, relative equality, uh, you have uh, some cooperation, you, you have a need for each other. Um, so when we, I mean, you can think of a sports, you know, like when we're on the football team, we're all trying to do the same thing. So we're different, um, some people are fast, some people are slow, some people are big and bulky, some people, but the, the, the shared goal creates a space where something happens that something emerges that wasn't there before. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, notice it's not the individual. It's your, this shared, you have individual expression, quarterback and the line, and I'm sorry to put the sports, sports metaphor. <laughs> um, but you think the same thing in terms of the military. It's another sort of fraught example. Um, but we've had tremendous, by some standards, success in the military of sort of dealing with some of these hard and persistent and stubborn disparities. Uh, and again, you sort of put people in a space, it's like your life depends on me. And my life depends on you. We have a common goal. Now the goal may be a messed up goal, uh, <laughs> but we share it. And out of that, and if you think about, you take oftentimes young white guys from the South, especially the rural South, tend to be overly conservative um, you take uh, young black guys and young Latino guys from the South, but also from urban areas. Um, you put them in, you send them a long ways away and you give them some guns. <laughs> That's like a great idea. <laughs> right? <laughs> Why does it work? Yeah, because um, they have a shared goal. Yeah. They have a shared goal and, yeah. and they're deliberate about it. And out of this experience, oftentimes come lasting friendships. Yeah. Um, so uh, so we can do something now in terms of schools, 
we don't have the same kind of um, prerogative, right? Mm -hmm. um, and our neighborhoods are segregated, our schools are segregated, our lives are still very much segregated. Uh, so part of the thing is how do we actually come together mm -hmm. uh, and, and start that perspective taking and sh have some shared goals, have some experience, build bridges, uh, um, build empathy and, and um, compassion for each other. Mm -hmm. Now, the good thing is some of that's happening. So it's not all bad. Um, and the, the people are largely doing it on their own. They get very little help from government. They get very little help from large institutions. And we, we tend to be what uh, uh, one person called, um, uh, what is this term? Something like, uh, basically we tend to reduce everything to the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, methodological individualist uh, is what the term he use, uses. Um, and so uh, it's like, what can I do? As opposed to not only can, what can we do, but how do we organize space, culture, institutions mm -hmm. to actually lend support to help us move in one direction as opposed to the other. Yeah. I'm sitting in my house right now, and I'm reminded because I'm looking out on my back porch, the 19... 40s and 50s, all the porches were in the front. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. As we became more, quite a, you know, private, we want all the porches in the back, mm -hmm. right? uh, so we don't have to interact with our neighbors so much. Yeah. Um, so there, there's a lot of ways that we can do this, but part of it, I think, is just taking it on the language we use, uh, but, and the difficult thing is when we're going upstream, swimming upstream, it takes a lot of work. So when we're going against the cultural norms, the, the, the physical practices, it's just, it feels hard. That's when we're going downstreams, it's just habits. We yeah, relax yeah. and all my friends tend to look like me. All my friends tend to go to the same church. If they go to church, all my friends have the same values. Um, well, that's a recipe for um, disunity, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so I wonder if we can talk through uh, briefly just some of the, the main kinds of situations that parents probably encounter this topic in. Um, and I think the first one of, of these I'd like to touch on is related to poverty. And this came up for me when we were driving through Oakland and my, my then four-year-old asked, you know, why, why are all these people camping on the side of the road? Because mm -hmm. she'd been camping, we'd been camping um, and saw, she saw the tents and, and assumed that they were camping. And so um, it seems to me as though any effort to kind of explain why some people are poor can never be adequate because, you know, there are so many factors <laughs> to include. Um, there are always individual factors to consider as well. So I'm assuming that when we talk to our children about poverty, we should um, kind of describe the structural issues and not make out like, oh, it's this person that made bad choices, um, but also add something about our individual experiences. And, and I'm wondering about about uh, you know, how do we balance not trying to be a white savior with um, acknowledging the other person's agency and, and how does that all come together when you see a person with a cup outside the grocery store and you want to do something to help and probably just shoving a banana at them that came out of your cart is not the right thing to do. Um, but but wh what is it that, um, that we can do that balances their need with the need of the other people outside all the other stores I'm gonna go to today as well? Well, um, you know, with your children, and my children are grown now, but I have grand grandchild, so I mm -hmm. have to rethink some of this again. <laughs> um, part of it is education. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, when I was growing up, there were virtually all the movies, all the in this cultural expression, was basically challenging extreme wealth. Uh, so the movies were more about either working class people, or even poor people, presented in a more uh, flattering way. Mm. Not true today. No. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and now we sort of, you know, oh, so and so has this many billions, and it's like a point of pride, right? And like, mm. oh, because this person has a billion, maybe they can, maybe even if they don't know anything and never done anything, they could be president. <laughs> yeah. At least have money, right? Uh, so that's, I think. Education can help, mm -hmm. help us. You know, we talk in this country a lot about being uh, race blind, which we're not and can't be. But really what we tend to be is structurally blind. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think for children, giving them both experience, but also giving them a language, educating them. Uh, 
And there was a bad movie that you may have seen. Um, it's called Trading Places with Eddie Murphy. I've heard of it. I'm not sure I've actually seen it. <laughs> yeah, take a, take a look at it. Okay. The, what's brilliant about the movie is Eddie Murphy is, I guess, either homeless or semi-homeless. Mm -hmm. And Dan Aykroyd is, is a well-heeled whatever and works for these billionaires or whatever. Okay. And these two brothers. And uh, one of them uh, thinks that one's um, disposition in life is biological, it's essential. Mm -hmm. The other one thinks it's situational. Mm -hmm. And so they make a bet. Uh, and the idea is they, they end up trading places between Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd. And they bring Eddie Murphy into this august, rich, well, you know, wealthy world and, and make Dan Aykroyd live on the streets. And uh, the question is, will their characteristics stay the same? And they don't. Uh, so I don't want to give you away the whole movie, but the <laughs> point is that for children, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's really smart because it's saying what's going on is largely situational. Mm -hmm. but it's not really a didactically. It's like a comedy. It is comedy, right? Mm -hmm. It's showing what happens when you put people in certain situations. And then the obvious question, if you, if you get that, then the question is, why do we put certain people in certain situations? Um, if you think it's the people, then it's nothing to be done. Right. If you think it's that guy's an alcoholic and the woman's a drug dealer and you know she's you know bad bad maybe it's a family, mm -hmm. um, so that's one. I think helping people and I think you could help do that with kids. I think you could do the very accessible stuff. Um, the other though is ourselves as, as parents. Uh, there's a lot of literature suggesting that the best one of the best ways the children learn is not simply what you tell them to do, but what they see you doing. Yes. You know, um, and they had this experiment of why parents, liberal parents, wanted their children to be open to all different races and stuff. And they had modest success, but not very much. And parents were like confused. It's like, you know, I talk to my kids about kids of a different color and I take them over a different, you know. And what they found is that a more powerful thing was if the child saw the parent having friends of a different race, mm -hmm. that was much more powerful than telling the kids to go figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and in terms of making a mistake, what I would say is make it, mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. Because um, i give you just two quick examples. I was living in San Francisco and I went into a very upscale uh, store. And there's this woman there who was very disabled and she had trouble negotiating the aisles. And the sort of cultural standard is you don't ask the disabled person if they need help. Mm -hmm. That's paternalistic or whatever. And this, and so finally, I just said, forget it. I went up to her and I said, can I help you? And this woman, she said, oh, thank you. And the store is packed with people, right? Mm -hmm. We're all being, you know, culturally correct by ignoring her. Uh, and then I helped her with her. Um, the other is, um, when I lived in San Francisco, I had a, a number of people who were homeless who uh, lived around me and I got to know some of them. This is one woman, I'll call her Mabel. Uh, you know, I'd talk to her almost every day and I'd give her some money and we'd have a conversation and then I'd say, so do you need anything today? And she'd say, well, I need money for food. And I'd give her money. And, and then one day I came home from a trip and I saw some friends over by Dolores Park and uh, we were hugging and yeah, good to see you, where you been? Um, and then they left and then I walked on and I saw Mabel. And I said, hi, Mabel, how are you? And she's, you know, um, uh, disheveled from living on the streets for very long and smelly and all that. And, um, and I said, so what do you need today? And she got quiet. And I said, she looked down. And I said, is everything okay? I said, yeah. And I said, do you need something today? And she said, could I have a hug? Mm -hmm. I, I was, had a feeling that was what you were going to say. <laughs> I hesitated. It's like, ooh, <laughs> you know, she might have lice and this and the other, but I did hug her um, and told some of my friends and they were teasing me, oh, John's girlfriend is homeless, you know. Mm -hmm. But what she was saying, she needed human contact. Yeah. You know, and she need, yeah, she needs money, she needs to eat, but she needs human contact. And I would say, without knowing, I don't know how much she benefited from that hug, but I certainly benefited from mm -hmm. it. Right? <laughs> Yeah. Something that was invaluable.
Yeah. So yes, you're going to make mistakes because there's not a playbook. Mm -hmm. And and, and uh, but um, uh, I've written, for example, about the danger of allyship. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't. I mean, it's not somebody else's game. I'm helping them with. This is our game. This is all of our game. Mm -hmm. We need to step into it. We need to be vulnerable. We need to be smart. Uh, we need to ask other people, um, and we'll make mistakes. And, and part of uh, uh, having grace and is giving us space to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I often say, I to err is human. To learn from error is intelligent. So I like intelligent humans. So we'll, you know, but but not to stand back to be so careful. Uh, and and what you inferred, which I will lift up, even if you didn't mean this, is that again, this is not poor people's problem. This is not black people's problem. This is not homeless people's problem. It is, but it's our problem. Our problem, yeah. And it's yeah. not their kids. It's not, you know, it's our kids. These are our kids. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, they have to be. Uh, I don't want to be, have too much hubris in terms of, uh, but when I was growing up, I grew up in Detroit, like literally, you know, somebody saw you going down the street to be, put your hat on, boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, parents, those are, those yeah, are everybody's kids. watching out for everybody else's kids. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. now we wouldn't do that. Yeah. It's my kid or it's not my kid. And yeah, we lost something with that. Yeah, for sure. I know we're running out of time. <laughs> and there were at least three more things I want to ask you about. I do want to end up with um, belongingness, because I know that's, that's kind of, that's your thing. Um, but before we get there, I wonder if we can so briefly talk about volunteering, because um, I, I really hadn't thought about this at all um, before I started researching this episode and how otherness can be kind of produced through volunteering. Because if, if we don't see the people we're volunteering for as other, then it wouldn't be called volunteering. <laughs> it would just be called working together or <laughs> something like that. Is there a way to, uh, to volunteer? And, and you know, often parents are bringing their kids along with volunteering and trying to instill um, val good values in them through doing this, which is why I'm so keen to ask the question. Um, is there a place for volunteering uh, in the way we raise our children? Uh, and if so, how do we talk about this in a way that doesn't other the people who are on the receiving end of it? Now, I think these are, again, complicated questions, in, in a, and I, I love them. Um, so partially, volunteering can set up a thing of othering, and it also can set up a thing or amplify one's station in terms of privilege, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go help these people. Yeah. Uh, and it's, and, and it's uh, optional. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I mean, the people who live, my, my daughter was in Nicaragua, and uh, there was some kind of natural disaster um, and literally bodies were being floating down the street and I was talking to her and I was saying, you know, you got to come home. And she said, you know, the people who here can't leave. Yeah. They don't have that available to them. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, but they're not. Really <laughs> you said, darn it. I didn't mean to teach you that well. <laughs> uh, and so part of being vulnerable is giving up that capacity to leave. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mm -hmm. like I'm, I'm in this this is my thing I'm committed mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what I'll do and what's going to be asked of me but I'm going to try mm, I, love that. That, though, I wouldn't uh, I would say give what you can because sometimes uh, people can't give everything mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason but then also try to learn from it um, and, and so um, you know as I say don't make the perfect enemy of the good mm -hmm. um, and um, um, but try to find those spaces where people can be more engaged, more vulnerable, where the tables are turned. So, for example, um, my sister who taught um, children in Detroit who were called ungraded, there were special, special needs children who were called in the day, uh, she would go to houses in Detroit in the wintertime and they have holes in the side of the house. And, you know, frankly, uh, there might be roaches crawling around. And she said, when people would offer her something like a glass of water that a roast just crawled out of, she would take it, mm -hmm. you know, because it was important. It's, it's important for all of us to contribute. Yeah. And, uh, and it's also important for um, us to have contribute from, accept things from other people. Mm -hmm. right? um, so being able to give is actually in a sense of blessing or a privilege. Um, and I say to my children that uh, they're not kids anymore, but uh, you can't 
totally uh, dishonor your privilege. You know, you've gone, my kids have gone to fancy schools and uh, both their parents are college professors. Um, they never went hungry and um, um, that's their, their privilege. Mm -hmm. um, they're more than middle class, right? And I said, you know, you can't just abandon that. You know, you could actually give away all your money. You still have the education, you still have, the thing is, what do you do with that privilege? Mm -hmm. uh, it's not um, the, uh, the Greeks have that myth of um, the, myth, um, the story of the golden bow, where this golden, the, the gods give the king and queen this golden bow and it produces all of this thing, all this abundance. And they're trust, they're entrusted with it, but it's not there. It's a, they're sharing with the people and, and, the, and the community and the nation thrives. At the point that they think is theirs and they stop sharing, everything goes bad, mm. right? So part of it is, um, do we see ourselves in relationship and, um, and uh, do we hoard or do we really share? Do we keep things flowing? Um, and volunteering can help in that. It's the first step, it's not the last step. Um, but you mentioned earlier about the person outside of a supermarket and do you give them a, a banana? If the person's hungry, you might say that banana helped. Mm -hmm. If you're thinking about it, you might say, well, this person, okay, this person, matter, but the thousands of people who need banana, uh, I didn't change the structure. Yeah. So I said, you know, start, do what you can. And John Rawls has this thing between what's reasonable and what's rational. Mm -hmm. And they're not the same. And we conflate them. And he's saying, what's rational in, the, in terms of schools, he says, what's rational, what's good for me and my family? Mm -hmm. What's reasonable is what's good for society. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't always come together neatly. We should try to bring them together, but not all the time. Uh, so it's rational for me to want my daughter to come home from a terrible situation. Someone might say it's not reasonable. She has skills or whatever. Um, we have to sort of deal with these complexities. Mm -hmm. uh, and not just complexity in other people, complexities within ourselves. We're internally conflicted. Um, and um, and certainly helping, trying to help our children navigate that, and respecting others as we try to as they try to navigate it. Um, uh, so I don't know if there's an answer in there somewhere. <laughs> I think there is. I mean, it's about uh, giving as much agency as possible, right? Grant granting agency. I, I don't know if, if even that's the right word because it assumes there's there's somebody there to grant the agency, but. <laughs> allowing for another person's agency while also having the freedom to make a mistake if you need to make a mistake and uh, but while giving what you can as, as much as you can. I think that's right. And I think recognizing from my perspective that even though we can't always live it or even that we're profoundly spiritually interconnected. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It goes to belongingness, right? Which is where I wanted to end up with this. And I don't know if you want to back up and share your your, your shirt with <laughs> those who can see it. Um, your Othering and Belonging Institute. Uh, I can't see the small type at the bottom, but I assume it's a URL. <laughs> Otheringandbelonging.berkeley.edu, something like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, so do you want to give us in give us your life's work in a two minute spiel? <laughs> um, what what is belonging and and building on what we've talked about so far? What can we do as parents to build towards it? Um, well, again, I think uh, belonging, you know, you think about Maslow mm -hmm. and his hierarchy of needs. Yeah. And he said, the first need is food, the second need is security, the third need is belonging. Mm -hmm. um, some of his uh, students now would say he got it wrong mm -hmm. as an order, that the first need is belonging. Mm -hmm. If you don't belong, you don't get food. <laughs> yeah. If you don't belong, you don't get security. Uh, none of us are self-made. Mm -hmm. um, we, we literally are part of each other. Um, and, I, and I think that one of the um, most extreme negative things that comes out of Western society is this notion that we're separate. Uh, and there's multiple separations. We're separate from each other. We're separate from the earth. We're separate from nature. Uh, we're separate from the divine. Or, um, uh, and, and in that separation, there's also fear and anxiety. So therefore, things that we're separate from, we feel like we have to control, we have to dominate, 
-hmm. And so that's our relationship with nature. It's like nature is there to be exploited. Uh, and we talk about in terms of self-preservation as if we can be, we can preserve ourselves and nature not exist. Mm -hmm. It's a contradiction. So belonging is, is start off by acknowledging that we're deeply connected to each other, deeply interconnected. And the right connection is what we're actually trying to get to. So the slave master and the enslaved person is also connected. The abusive husband and the battered wife are also connected. So it's not just connection. It's the right kind of connection. Mm -hmm. uh, a connection that's animated at least um, by our shared vulnerability, uh, uh, by our shared need of each other, uh, by our shared rush to the grave. Um, uh, in the case of you dealing with children, by shared love of our children. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and then how do we keep amplifying that? Um, and so, um, and, and belonging also then calls into a kind of agency because it's, it's based on the notion of we co-create the world in which we live. It's not ours, it's not yours, um, and it's not even just human. Uh, we're all part of it, we all have a part of it. And part of the part of it, we will never fully understand. Uh, um, and that's in some ways where spirituality or religion comes into place. We call to do things that don't make sense, that we can't explain. Um, and, and yet, in my sense, that's what makes us really alive uh, and, and human. So belonging is closely associated with, with love um, and caring. Uh, um, both inside and outside. So, um, yeah, I say the antidote for othering is not saying what belonging. Yeah. It's a process. It's not something that we arrive at. Uh, so some people would say can't happen, right? Um, uh, but it can be what Bernstein calls a regulative ideal. It actually tells us, it organizes our behavior. It organizes our ethics. It organizes our life, even if we can't achieve it. Uh, my father's a Christian minister, so most Christians will say they can't live exemplary lives um, you know, of, of Jesus. Most Muslims would say they can't live the exemplary life of Muhammad. Most Buddhists would say they can't live the exemplary, but it orients them in a certain way. Yeah, you still try, yeah. right? <laughs> so that's what belonging does. It orients yeah. us in a certain way in a world, not just in a country or in our neighborhood, but in the world, that we're in this together. And the coronavirus is such a powerful example that we are interconnected and that what I do affects you and what you do affects me. Uh, and so people who think that my freedom, somebody's telling me I can't go outside, how dare they? You know, it's my body. Um, maybe it's your body, but, it's, but your body affects other bodies. Uh, we are connected and it's not an abstract. And with the... Uh, novel coronavirus says is that, yes, take me from body to body. This is how I get around. I can't walk by myself. I need you, human, to take me from body to body. And we're doing an amazing job. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> if we stop doing it, it feels bad, right? Like, yeah. Uh, but how do we actually hold that in a healthy way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, a slightly depressing note to end on, but overall, uh, a fabulously uplifting <laughs> episode, I think. Um, thank you so much for, for sharing your time and, and your life's work with us and, and, uh, and really helping us to um, get some tools to move beyond this kind of feeling of paralysis, well, I, I don't know what to do, to, to, um, to think about how we can create this society that wh where people do belong, where everybody has the right to belong, where everybody feels like they do belong. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you for your work. Thank you. And so I do want to give a hat tip to Brian Stout, who introduced us. And I have to say that in some ways that talking with you is worse than talking with him, because when I talk with him, I come out with this massive list of things I now have to go and read. And I think my list with you was even longer. Um, but uh, I will put a full list of references, as many of them as I can track down and that I caught um, on the episode page, and uh, as well as links to Dr. Powell's book, Racing to Justice, Transforming Our Conceptions of Self and Other to Build an Inclusive Society, a link to the Othering and Belonging Institute, that Dr. Powell leads and the Institute's podcast as well. They have a podcast called Who Belongs? And all of those resources can be found at yourparentingmojo.com forward slash othering. Mm -hmm.